Well, hi everyone. I recently did a video about an NTSB announcement that tracked down a particular fault with the MV Dolly electrical propulsion and control system. And I touched on two interesting things in that video, that, although I didn't dwell on it. And that is the replacement costs for the Francis Scott Key Bridge has ballooned from essentially a billion and a half dollars to well over $5.2 billion, which I think is, is unacceptable, but I'm going to cover that because it has really serious implications, not for this project alone, but for many other potential projects across the country. And the other thing I want to cover is the liability aspect. In the early days of this disaster from back in March 2024, I stated that it appeared to me that Maryland state officials were negligent in the way they operated this bridge project by not having adequate peer protection to protect from the ship collision with this bridge. And recent statements from the NTSB and others fully support that view. When I was preparing for this video, today's December 5th, 2025, I came across this article that was published just a few days ago by the Reason Foundation, and this article's titled Surface Transportation News Key Bridge Replacement Costs Soar. And this Reason Foundation apparently advances a free society by developing, applying, and promoting libertarian principles, including individual liberty, free markets, and the rule of law. And they had some very specific thoughts about what's going on with the Francis Scott Key design build replacement project. And of course, what we learned recently on November 18th through various news outlets is that the cost of this project has ballooned and the time frame now has extended another two years for completion from 2028 to past the end of 2030 at this point. And in this Reason article, they referenced the NTSB press release where NDTA was found to be at least partly responsible for the bridge's collapse. NTSB noted that countermeasures such as dolphins could have been implemented if NDTA had performed the Ashto risk assessment. Assessment. I'm going to circle back on that later, but many bridge owners, even if the bridge wasn't designed to accommodate or to protect against larger ship impact, got the warning when many other ship collisions uh, took out portions of bridges, killed uh, many people in, in the process, and I just thought it was ridiculous that NBTA would design and build a bridge in 1977 and let decade after decade go by before they addressed upgrading the protection for this bridge. And so the existing dolphins were only 25 foot in diameter. And what we've seen for bridges of this size and this importance is you have a series of dolphins, at, at the very least, typically on the order of 50 feet in diameter. And this Ashto guidance has been around since the 90s. They updated it in 2009. And essentially this is an organization that consists of various state bridge officials, bridge owners, if you will. And they said, you know, we've got to go through this rigorous assessment for risk of ship collision with our bridges, but it only applies to new bridges, which was, was silly. And what NTSB stated here recently is that they should apply that methodology uh, to existing bridge projects. And I've been critical of that methodology. I'm not going to get back into that today, but Again, these bridge owners have a responsibility to provide or attempt to provide adequate protection against ship impact, and it didn't happen here. Going back to this recent article, they're estimating a overall construction cost somewhere between $4.3 billion and $5.2 billion, which is staggering to me. The original estimates were somewhere around $1.7 billion. I think the excuses cited for this tripling in the estimated costs are wholly unacceptable and don't pass the smell test, as it were, and I'll go over that. And they quote this congressperson from West Virginia, and they feel outraged by this development, and they didn't think it was fair that taxpayers were going to be on the hook for 100% of the cost when the cost estimate was around $1.7 billion, let alone $5.2 billion. And Kiewit's been involved with managing the design-build work for this replacement project going back to August 2024. They're a very reputable design build contractor. So the news of this major escalation in estimated total cost for this bridge replacement came in mid-November. I mean, what's been going on for the last year? They they had no inkling that the costs were going to go up 
uh, by a factor of three. I just don't believe it. Now, one of the things that was cited for the reason for the greatly inflated cost now for the replacement is that they had to have a longer span for the main channel. Basically make a ship run aground before it would hit one of the bridge piers. Also included the installation of a massive pier protection system. But this design concept has been around since February of this year. Again, they knew full well what kind of project they were going to have with this replacement. And to say that the, suddenly there's a surprise because steel costs a little bit more, or now the bridge span is longer just doesn't make any sense if you look at the timeline. And in fact, there's thinly veiled references to blaming tariffs uh, on steel for the price increase. And that doesn't make sense either because most federally funded projects have what's called the Buy America Act. And these bridges uh, are expected to utilize made in USA materials, particularly uh, high cost or, or major component items like structural steel and reinforcing steel. So that tariff excuse doesn't make sense to me. And they knew that they were gonna have to build a bridge with a longer span and that a cable stay bridge would likely be the type that was utilized because it's very efficient to have very long spans with that type of bridge design. But again, they've known for many months what the new features of this replacement bridge were likely to include. And this reason article continues, and I cite it because it echoes my own views in this situation. It says, due to its contributory negligence in not protecting the key bridge piers, in no way should all U.S. taxpayers be on the hook for the new bridge's construction cost. And it talks about various funding mechanisms that should be pursued by the state of Maryland instead. And there's this representative, John Garamond, from California indicated, I don't think this has to be federal taxpayer money. Let's go first to the insurance side of it, and then we'll see what's left over. So I'm going to cover the, some of the legal and insurance aspects here in just a second. But there's another interesting article here about this situation in Maryland Matters. And again, I have links to these various sources of information in the description to this video. So obviously there's a lawsuit. There's both a federal and state lawsuit. The federal lawsuit against the owners of the MV Dolly has largely been settled uh, to the tune of around $102 million. And that was to reimburse the federal government for the cleanup costs in removing the Dolly and the bridge debris that was in the channel so that navigation could resume. So I'll draw your attention to the middle of this page where there's a reference to average of 30,000 vehicles per day that crossed the key bridge before this disaster occurred. That's on the high side, but it's not nearly as high as some other bridges throughout the Northeast in particular. And towards the bottom of this other section of this article, within hours of the bridge's collapse, then President Joe Biden promised that the federal government would cover 100% of the cost of replacement. That pledge was later codified into law by Congress. And I remember at the time thinking, wait a minute, well, what's the rush for the federal taxpayer to be on the hook for this entire replacement cost? I didn't understand that at the time. I don't understand it now. So let's go back to this NTSB press release from November 18th, talking about the loose wire that triggered this sequence of events with the power outage that resulted in the collision with the pier on the key bridge and caused it to collapse. So from this press release at the top here, contributing to the collapse of the key bridge and the loss of life was the lack of countermeasures to reduce the bridge's vulnerability to collapse due to impact by ocean-going vessels, which have only grown larger since the key bridge's opening in 1977. Well, that's pretty straightforward. You know, in these NTSB reports, they go to great lengths to not assign blame to any party. They want to stay out of the legal entanglement of things, but in this case, it was so obvious that there should have been better protection for this bridge against ship impact, and they just didn't do it. In fact, post 9-11, there was a review of critical bridges in many states, including Maryland, and they looked at the key bridge. I asked for a copy of that report after this disaster occurred in March of 2024, and it was so heavily redacted that I, I couldn't even read anything about. It. I just knew in general what the topic was, and that was evaluating uh, potential hazards to this bridge, primarily from bad actors. Now, this is the main issue to me that has me concerned about federal taxpayers being on the hook for the replacement costs, because the idea was the feds would front the money, and then they would recoup that money 
through Maryland's lawsuit against the owners of the MV Dolly. And I've got this from a, a law firm and on their website, they're really advertising to, to motorists, but the, the basis of the law here is still the most important thing. And we go to the second paragraph. Unfortunately, Maryland is not a comparative negligent state. It's a contributory negligent state. This is potentially bad news for accident victims because insurance companies find it easier to reject their claims in Maryland. If an insurance company or its legal team can make a case you are even slightly responsible for your accident, you could end up with nothing. And that's what we're talking about here. A jury could very well find that the state of Maryland was somewhat negligent or shared in the negligence of the situation that led to the collapse of the bridge by not adequately providing collision protection for the bridge piers. And then we have this other article, uh, Louisiana Law Review. It's talking about the Limitation Act relative to the key bridge. So this addresses the potential for limiting the liability of the owners of the MV Dolly because of an 1851 law. They state under the Limitation Act of 1851, vessel owners who face a complaint of an incident involving their vessel can file a complaint in limitation in an appropriate court, which they've done. Once filed in the appropriate court, their liability may be capped at post-accident value of the ship plus the pending freight. And in the case here, that's about $43.7 million. So a drop in the bucket if you're talking about spending over $5 billion to replace this bridge. So this brings me to one of the main things I want to emphasize in this video, and that is how does public policy get applied towards replacement or refurbishment of public infrastructure, particularly for transportation projects? And I want to show you this population graph for the city of New Orleans. And just immediately before Hurricane Katrina, total population was near a million people. The high was slightly over a million people in 1980, and the population had steadily declined since then. And then post-Katrina, the city basically depopulated to a large degree, down to 700,000 residents. And then after extensive repair, replacement uh, of flood protection measures for the city of New Orleans by the federal government, people have come back to New Orleans and the population has slowly increased to be slightly greater than that uh, before Hurricane Katrina occurred in 2005. But my point here is that in the immediate aftermath of Katrina, there were a few voices out there that said, hey, wait a minute, does it make sense for the federal government to spend billions and billions of dollars restoring flood protection to a city that is inherently at risk because on average, they're eight feet below sea level in an area that's prone to hurricanes. I mean, Katrina is not gonna be the last major hurricane to hit New Orleans, unfortunately. And the people that brought that idea up that, hey, maybe we just leave New Orleans as it is, have a, a tourist district where people could come in and leave in short order. There's really no subdivisions or apartment buildings, housing, thousands and thousands of people, that gets redeveloped somewhere else. And those people were unfortunately accused of all kinds of vulgar motivations. And that discussion dropped very quickly post-Katrina. But I think it's a fair policy question to examine if it makes sense to spend billions of dollars to restore infrastructure or build new infrastructure in an area that's inherently unstable or at high risk. Then there's the question of, could there be better uses of $5 billion from the federal government for infrastructure throughout the country? And I've done a number of videos about the Washington Bridge in Rhode Island, and the available evidence is this is the location where the westbound bridge has now been demolished, and they've rerouted six lanes of traffic now in two directions on what was formerly just the eastbound bridge. And that bridge carries over 100,000 vehicles per day. So I'd argue it's far more important than the Francis Scott Key Bridge at 30,000 vehicles a day. Even though in the case of Rhode Island, the DOT management let the old bridge simply fall apart. They weren't providing adequate inspection supervision. They weren't implementing uh, corrective maintenance and repair measures in my opinion. And so even in this case, I have some concerns or, or many concerns actually of the federal government just handing over 80% of the costs of 
this replacement bridge project, was, which is now expected to cost well in excess of $400 million. So just to show you what a few billion dollars can do, there's a big project in the state of Missouri along I-70, 250 mile stretch from Kansas City to St. Louis. It has a massive amount of truck traffic. If you've ever driven from Kansas City to St. Louis and back again, it's one of my least favorite drives in the country just because of the sheer volume of vehicles, including truck traffic, but it's an important trucking corridor in particular. But for $2.8 billion total project cost, they're gonna replace dozens of bridges because they're gonna add a lane in both the eastbound and westbound directions of I-70. And I think that's a much better bang for your buck of what they're projecting now for the Francis Scott Key Bridge replacement. Who thinks that they're gonna hold at $5.2 billion for the key bridge replacement, it's likely to go even higher because they're at the 70% design level, not the 100% design level, and we've got at least five years to go before this bridge would be finished. And you can see this map of long haul truck traffic across the country. There are other routes that are even of greater importance than I-70 based on its volume. So to summarize, I think Signing up for a five plus billion dollar replacement for the Francis Scott Key Bridge is a bad investment for US taxpayers. I don't think it's fair for US taxpayers to pay that amount of money and that higher percentage, which is 100% at this point of the replacement costs. There could be much better use of these funds in other places of the country, but maybe somebody could justify it. I haven't seen the study that says the disruption to the traffic in that area is going to be so much greater than the cost to replace this bridge, even at $5 billion. I, I haven't seen that analysis because I don't think it was ever done. I think it was a, essentially a bait and switch. That, hey, we'll spend maybe a billion dollars, a billion and a half, replace this bridge. The U.S. government said, yeah, we're going to pay for all the costs. And if we get insurance money back, then we'll, you could pay us back. And I don't think that's going to happen and the costs keep going up and up and up. So I'd be interested in what you all think down there. Let me know in the comments section. With that, I wanna send a shout out to those of you who've contributed to Buy Me A Coffee. That's one of the better ways to support this channel. I also wanna send a shout out to channel members and those of you who've contributed to Super Thanks. And certainly thank you for watching and commenting to my videos. Thanks very much, everyone.